Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Evans, and today I want to look at a question that we're being asked more and more these days. What is the best advice for people on or about to start opioid medications? Now, an opioid is a pain reliever. Some examples include medications that you may have heard of, like codeine, Percocet, Oxycontin, morphine, Vicodin, Duragesic, or, or the fentanyl patch, Dilaudid, and others. And today I'm talking about opioids and their specific role in what we call chronic non-cancer pain. So, so I'm not talking about those situations where patients take pain meds for end-of-life care or cancer pain or, or even for short-term pain, like when you break a bone or have an operation. A chronic pain could be something like a back pain that just doesn't go away. Now, chronic pain has a variety of definitions, uh, but I tend to think of two main features. Timing, it, it lasts for longer than three to four months, beyond the expected time for normal tissue healing. And secondly, function, it adversely affects the well-being of the individual. So these people are in pain most of the day, most days. In some ways, the story is as much about me as it is you. And, and by me, I mean those of us in the medical community. Let's go back in time a bit to the late 1980s. During that decade, there was a movement within medicine to increase awareness of pain in our patients and to be more aggressive in treating pain. This made sense, I think, and still does. Uh, pain, especially the constant type, can be a life record. It's hard to get up in the morning, hard to go to work, hard to hang with friends and family, which is why treating pain is so very important. During this period, we started to see emerging evidence that opioids were successful when prescribed by specialists to patients who were carefully selected and closely monitored. This was the case, at least in short-term trials for treating pain, and some experts were arguing that the addiction rate was only about 1%. Many in the medical community interpret the evidence at that time as, okay, we're into treating pain because of our concerns around addiction and side effects, but it looks as if you are truly in pain, you can't get addicted. But what we've learned since then, especially in the last few years, is that the truth is more complicated than that. Much more. Although the intent was noble, I, I think we misled patients. The truth, or, or let's say the reality about using opioids, seems to fall into two categories, reassessing the downsides of opioids and, and reassessing the benefits of opioids. So let's start with the downsides. To do that, we need to get our terminology straight. Almost all patients who take opioids daily are physically dependent in the sense that they will experience withdrawal symptoms if the opioid is suddenly stopped. This is not the same as addiction. People are said to be addicted to a drug when they feel a compulsion to keep taking the drug despite the harm it's doing to them. These harms can be social, financial, or psychological. I should point out that this line between physical dependence and addiction sounds clear, but you know it, it can be hard to delineate in the real world. So the good news is that most patients on opioids do not become addicted to them. Having said that, it turns out opioids are addictive for many more people than we thought. Estimates vary, but a 2011 analysis of a health system that serves 31 counties in Pennsylvania, led by Dr. Joseph Boscarino, showed that the rate of what's called opioid use disorder is not 1%, but is actually as high as 35%. These numbers suggest a pattern that's not dissimilar to addictions like smoking or drinking, where most people don't become addicted, but a good percentage do, even if they're in pain. There is also a group of people who misuse opioids without much interest in pain reduction and don't take the prescription as it is intended, for example by crushing pills to snort them or inject them. This can increase risk of overdosing, but people can still become addicted or overdose even if they are taking opioids to reduce pain. Combine all this with the fact that opioid prescriptions have gone up by more than 600% between 2002 and 2010 and we have a problem. According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC, we have more people addicted to prescription opioids than heroin and cocaine combined. These people are not just patients on high doses for a long time or the marginalized. These people can be CEOs, celebrities, stay-at-home moms, even your friends or family members. Also, opioids, like other medications, have side effects. For example, disordered breathing with sleep, increased falls and fractures, hormone problems like low testosterone, nausea and constipation. I know I'm beginning to sound like one of those drug ads we see on TV, but, but let me ratchet it up even one more step. By some estimates, more than 100,000 North Americans have died of accidental prescription opioid overdoses over the last 20 years. Opioid overdose is now the second leading cause of unintentional death in the United States, second only to motor vehicle accidents. And like MVAs, opioid overdoses often happen to young people. It's worth noting that most of the deaths are accidental and, and typically occur in people who have also consumed alcohol or, or taking sleeping pills at the same time. 
At least 10% of people who take opioids also have unhealthy behaviors such as hoarding, using with alcohol, over-sedating on purpose, borrowing from friends, and so on. If I just look at my home province of Ontario, three times as many people died of opioid overdose than of HIV AIDS in 2011. And to me, these are incredible stats, and I, I suspect many of you are hearing these figures for the first time. All of these developments have prompted the CDC to label pharmaceutical opioid overdose as a national epidemic. So, okay, now we have some more clarity on the downsides. Let's reassess the benefits of opioid use. As we've said, there are many who can take opioids for a short-term pain, who tolerate the medications well, and, and who experience a real benefit in the reduction of their pain. However, when we look at the emerging research on people taking opioids longer than, say, 90 days, we see that the data is somewhat limited. And what research there is shows that the benefits for many may shrink in the long run. It seems that the brain actually adapts to opioids, although I would say the individual response is variable. Clinically, what we see is that many patients go on opioids for chronic pain and stay on a stable dose. Others find that they do better when they reduce their dosage, and another group comes back to us requiring more pain control. And this last group can have a challenge. I think it's also important to know that as a doctor, prescribing opioids can be more complicated than most other medications. I would guess that if I surveyed doctors about the toughest part of their practice, this would be at or, or near the top for most. Instead of shared decision making, with opioids, I often feel as I need to be more directive to get my patients the best outcome. Taking an opioid may help your pain today, but, but I may feel the longer term benefit is questionable because of unacceptable side effects or, or, or limited effectiveness. I make you feel worse tomorrow, which you aren't happy about, but, but I might see a bigger picture. There are other factors that complicate the relationship. Opioids require a written prescription, and, and because I don't want to prescribe too much at once, patients have to come back and see me, sometimes often. Then there are concerns about when others access your medications. For example, since 2002, the U.S. prevalence of high school seniors reporting past year non-medical use of opioids has been 8-10% to 10 for hydrocodone and 4-5% to 5 for oxycodone. Some patients simply sell their prescriptions, and it can be very hard for us in the healthcare profession to figure out who is tricking us and who is not. My sense is that many patients who are taking opioids get painted with this wider brush of suspicion, which is, which is unfortunate. So when you combine these complicated social and legal factors with the emerging data on opioids that suggests that for many, their effectiveness mm -hmm. diminishes over time, you can see why prescribing these medications has become so complex. And why the question I posed at the beginning, what is the best advice for people on or, or about to start opioid medications, is actually not so simple. But now that we've reviewed some of the background information and stepped through the assessment of the downsides and benefits to opioids, I'd like to offer five strategies as a partial answer to that question. Number one, if you are on opioids and have any concerns about addiction or side effects, definitely talk to your healthcare providers. We don't want to judge you. We want to make you healthy. Like smoking or, or other addictions, it can be hard for you to voice your concerns. But believe me, we clinicians prefer when the improvement process starts with you. You can talk to your care provider or, or maybe see a specialist to create an opioid exit strategy. You can wean down your dose of opioids slowly over time or, or switch to safer alternatives. As with other common addictions, this can involve short-term pain for long-term gain. The good news, though, is that Many patients that have weaned down or off opioids often experience improved function and mood, as well as less pain. Number two, if you're considering opioid for your pain, make sure you've tried other safer alternatives first. If, if you do decide to take an opioid, try to limit your use, and you, you should set a date where you want to make a decision whether you want to continue or stop. If your function hasn't improved, if, if you can't get back to work or, or get around more easily, and your pain has only improved a little or not at all, then there's probably no point in continuing. On the other hand, if your pain has improved substantially and your function improves, you might continue or you might see if you can maintain the gain of function without opioids. Number three is all about reflecting on your approach to pain. Maybe now is the time to hit the reset button and take a fresh look at non-medicinal forms of treatment such as activity, therapy, acupuncture, mind-body work, cognitive behavioral therapy, and so on. Maybe add a new clinician to your team or, or see what a chronic pain clinic has to offer to replace your medications. Number four, make sure that people who you don't want to access your medications can't. Keep them in a safe spot. A lockbox is a good idea and give your pharmacist back any opioids you are not using. If we just look at Ontario, non-medical use of opioids ranks third on the list of drugs of choice by students and 67% are getting them from home. Number five, don't increase your dose without supervision. 
And there is considerably more risk with higher dose medications like oxycodone, hydromorphone, or fentanyl patches than, say, Tylenol 3s. Have one prescriber that has a record of all your medications and stick to one pharmacy. And don't combine opioids with alcohol or other drugs, as that is where people seem to run into major problems. So to summarize, I think my objective in this lecture was to raise awareness of the changing thinking on opioids, not to make you feel guilty if you're taking opioids for pain. Chronic pain is something that needs to be treated, but I also felt that it was important to bring you up to speed on some of the concerns about opioids so that you can make better decisions. It's a new wrinkle and a challenge that both patients and healthcare providers are going to have to take on. Now think about it. Talk to your doctor about what the best strategy for you might be. I hope this helps.